loving loving this bird, loving the event. Um, and yeah, let's let's rock and roll. It's really nice to be here. Uh, this is, uh, and I'm not altogether sure why, one of the warmest and most interesting yes. conventions that I've ever done. We've all felt that, yeah. haven't we? It's really good. So I uh, look forward to coming back again sometime. Anyway, good to see you all. Good. Uh, first question. Right this way, sir. I've, of course, had the pleasure of meeting you both already uh, and uh, had some interesting questions for you, I think. But uh, one of the things that I'd like to kind of get it all kicked off with is how did Star Wars change your life? I mean, we know how it changes the fans' lives and everything, but how has it changed your life both professionally and personally and, and those kinds of things? Well, for myself, um, when I did Star Wars in 83 and 96, it was for me, for my career, it was just part of my career. And the thing that I've, I've found that's really changed is coming to the conventions and meeting the fans and understanding what the 501st is all about and the great courses that they do, um, traveling. So that's been wonderful, but actually as, a, as, a, as part of my career, it was just another say, job that I was doing. So um, but that for me, that's how it's, it's, it's sort of changed my life, just meeting new, wonderful, great people and to just understand the convention scene and the great phenomena that it's created. I would uh, echo what Femi has said. Uh, when we did, I mean, admittedly, when I did Return of the Jedi, the, the whole saga was pretty well established at that stage, and they knew that they were you know, making a hit uh, movie. But that particular year, um, I did um, Octopussy as well, so I was in sort of two major movies, and it, it, it was at the time uh, I didn't realize the impact it would have. Uh, it was just it was just another job, uh, and I don't mean that in a sort of to denigrate it. It was a very exciting another yeah. job. Uh, how often do you get to get up in the morning and go to work and you know go into battle? and say, may the force be with you, <laughs> not very often, uh, and get paid for it. And, um, but uh, you know, having done it, uh, I moved on and did something else, and then suddenly the movie was released, and uh, I was introduced to a whole world of, of the Star Wars universe and, and all the fans around the world, and it was only gradually over the years I've realized the impact, because not for one moment did I believe in 1982 that I would be sitting in Pittsburgh 30 years later talking with you all and, and that's why the whole thing is so unique I think. Next question. Right there, thank you sir. Uh, this is a question for both of you actually. Um, being that the soccer had already been established when you came on board, what was it like working with original cast members like Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford? That's my first question for both of you. And for the second question is for Femi. Um, was Jabba the Hutt, what was that? Was that, what was that? Exactly, what was it? It was <laughs> disgusting. Um, first of all, the first question. Uh, fortunately, in 1983, when I did it originally, um, I had Carrie and Mark and um, Harrison Ford, Billy D. Williams on set so it wasn't blue screen so it was just the, the, the wonderful thing was just sitting in between takes and mark hamill coming up and having little chats with me or really really saying oh hello girl and how you doing <laughs> doing all that i can't do the american accent sorry so i'm just embarrassed myself um so that was lovely just to have a nice little rapport with the with, with the actors what was the second question what was jabba the hood oh yeah that's right <laughs> jabba was that was amazing because he, there was four people, as you know, there were four people in there. He was very, very, I mean, very long. He was probably about three meters long. Um, but he was just really real. It was he, he was disgusting. I can't really describe. There were people in Java. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's four people. There's one. Yeah. Oh my God. Doing the, the yeah. There was a little TV monitor. One doing the tail. One breathing. So um, he was very real. But when I went back to 1996, I had to blue screen. It wasn't the same. So I was fortunate in, in 82. Um, I can't speak uh, about Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask me. Uh, but it, uh, just as a, as a sidebar to it, I think it's very interesting that there were four people inside it and that wouldn't happen these days. And I think it's, um, 
it's kind of part of the magic of the original trilogy that you know none of us knew that the kind of that sort of technology would exist in the future and so when the first original movie happened and that extraordinary ship you know came at us across the screen I think it changed everybody's life and um, now personally speaking uh, you know every major blockbuster that's released for the holidays I look at it and I think I don't believe you because we all know how it's done and it's kind of lost that sort of um, creative magic that I feel that the, the trilogy has and I'm, I'm sure a, a lot of true Star Wars fans agree with that. Um, as regards um, um, meeting the, uh, working with the stars of it, um, my memory of it was that they were incredibly nice and uh, extremely uh, helpful and pleasant to be with. Um, I was quite scared. The, the, um, the, the set that I was on with Mom Martha, uh, with Caroline Blakeston, uh, cost half a million pounds in 1982, which was an enormous amount of money, uh, and still is. And uh, but boy, when you walked onto it, you could see the money was spent. It was absolutely sensational. That was very overwhelming, you know. Um, but the, the more we shot it, the more relaxed we became, and began to really enjoy it. And a particular thrill for me. Um, I was always a great Simon and Garfunkel fan, and Carrie Fisher was, um, as we say in Ireland, doing a line uh, with Paul Simon at the time, and he was over, uh, and I got to have coffee with him uh, in the uh, canteen one day with her, and uh, that was a huge thrill for me. And next question, right this way. How did you get your role, like? How did they know that you were supposed to be Java's slave, and what got you into that part? Um, well, I have an agent, um, and I, they called me up, and they said, we have a casting for you for a film. Um, please go ahead, go along and go for the casting. We can't tell you what it is. So that's what happened. So I went for the casting. I met Richard Markman, Nate Richard Markman. And then he asked if I could dance, and I said yes. And he said, we're going to call a few girls back. And we did a brooding dance audition. And as we were getting changed, someone said, what is this film? And there was a huge gasp, and they said, it's the next Star Wars movie. Um, and back then, I was doing the show Cats. So I was, I was taking the choreographer back into London. And he said, look, I think you've got it, but I can't say. And anyway, when I got back to the stage show, they said, I had a phone call saying that you've got the role. So that's how it came about, getting getting the part. I just auditioned. Thank you both for coming. First. And I got a question for both of you. Two part. What's the most memorable in the movie? And do you have any regrets? I'm sorry, what's the most memorable moment in your movies? In in, in Star Wars. Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm in it so briefly that my entire performance is a memorable moment. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but um, I, I did have great uh, fun as a sort of uh, 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 a, a little extra that I'm sure most of you know more about than I do, in that uh, when I finished doing my scene and I was about to leave uh, at the end of the job, uh, and I was leaving the sound stage, and uh, the, one of the assistant directors said, what, what are you doing next week? And I said, nothing. And he said, uh, George, we'd like you to come back. And so I went back, and I had a wonderful four or five days uh, flying and uh, getting into battle uh, and working with the second unit, which George was directing, all of which ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, however, I think it lies somewhere in the vaults of Lucasfilms, and um, some of the fans here for the first time have told me um, that uh, apparently those scenes are now in the Blu-ray version, which has just been released, so I would look forward to, to seeing what it was like all those years ago. The other memorable event was that because it was, the franchise was a hit when we both worked on it, they were uh, understandably incredibly secretive uh, about the movie and, and we 
were under strict order to hand this to the end of every day shooting. Next question. Wait this way, ma'am. Um, for you personally, do you feel that the three prequels contribute to the story or detract from the story? That's a difficult one for me to answer because I haven't seen them. So, um, I can't say, but I mean, what's your story? A really good story. I, I just, I think, I feel the originals outdo the prequels. Um, I, I don't know, I, th I think that I, I was saying too, I just feel they've lost the spirit of it. Um, and we're just so fortunate to be in the original three. And I think that sort of holds the test of time. Yes. How do you feel Star Wars 7 is going to be like with Disney making it? Well, we should wait and see. We're, wait, we're all waiting to see. Yeah. Everyone asked that question. But, um, They're an extremely successful um, film company. Yeah. Uh, it will be fascinating to see what they what they do with it because it's a. I think it's a watershed of the whole sort of world of Star Wars. Um, you are the people who will decide whether it's a success or not. doing shows a while back, you took some time off, and now you're, you're back and you're doing shows again. I, I know you've been shows for, you know, throughout your, your time after the, the film. How has how shows like this changed from when you first started something of attending these shows and meeting us all to, to now? For me, they haven't changed. Um, I mean, I, I started doing the shows in 1999, I think, and I did them for about 10 years and I stopped because I was doing other things. I didn't have time to come out. But I feel that they're still, they're still wonderful. They're still great, as I said earlier on. It's so good to just meet so many fantastic, wonderful people. And that's just a continuation. And also it's like having a family. I think I was saying to you, Frank, that it's like coming back home. Because we have all a common consciousness of loving something. Star Wars. So that's the lovely thing when I'm getting some me time away from my boys at home. It's like coming to another family and even if I have not met you, I feel that I know you. So that's that's lovely, that's wonderful. And thank you. Um, I find unless one goes to specifically to a Star Wars convention, which this isn't for example, um, when, when I started going there there were mainly specifically Star Wars conventions, at least in the UK. Uh, but now there are so many franchises like Harry Potter, for example, and Doctor Who, and um, The Hobbit, and you know all of that. However, what thrills me about the one that I happen to be involved with uh, is the fact that it's kind of going down the generations. Um, in that, you know. Uh, I see people who not only are their children Star Wars fans, but their grandchildren are Star Wars fans. Um, and you can imagine how old that makes me feel. But, um, but it's, it, it, I, I think it's kind of a mark of uh, the fact that the, the series is iconic and I think will continue long after we're all gone. Uh, I think it's so special and it's lasted for such a long time. Uh, for both of you, what's the big difference between UK fans and American fans, especially when you come to the conventions? And for Mr. Crowley, what's it like to work on uh, Luther? Um, I, I personally can't see any difference between uh, fans here and fans in America. Uh, uh, your knowledge of your subject and your passion, uh, both here and in the UK, is extraordinary and has certainly taught me an awful lot <laughs> over the years. Um, so I don't really, I, I think the trilogy is the common factor between 
fans, and I, I think you could put Star Wars fans in a room together from any country in the world, and they would be able to speak a common language. Um, as regards Luther, um, I don't know how many of you know Luther, but it, it, I, I'm amazed and gratified and absolutely delighted to come here to realize that uh, it's actually very, seems to be very popular in America. It was shown on uh, BBC America, first of all, and now it's on Netflix. It's a kind of a very tough uh, cop drama about uh, a policeman called Luther, who's played by the wonderful, charismatic, and talented Idris Elba. Uh, and it's about a cop who's kind of almost as bad morally as the bad guys that he's chasing. He just about teeters on the verge of staying on the right side of the law. Um, and uh, it was wonderful to do. We did three series of it. Uh, and sadly, we won't be doing any more because um, Idris has become too big a star and it doesn't have time. And uh, also the marvelous scriptwriter Neil Cross um, is currently working on uh, a pirate series uh, for NBC. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to have a look at Netflix. Yes. I have a question for uh, both of you dealing with the makeup involved. Um, Femi Taylor, uh, this is the first time I've seen you in person. I see you have long hair. And I'm just wondering, uh, when they did the makeup for you for Ula, did they put your long hair into the head tails or did they have you shave your hair? Well, no, 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 they, I did, but they just, you just have a wrap and you just wrap it around and put a stocking cap on. Very glamorous. Uh, <laughs> and then you put the, the, the legus on top, it's like a helmet, so I didn't have to, they, I didn't have to do anything with my hair. Uh, Dermot, uh, for you, is it true that part of the reason they had you have the beard is because they already had the action figure produced. Now, uh, where did you hear that? <laughs> I, I heard a podcast recently, and they were they were saying that originally they told you we want you to have a beard, and you said, "Well, you should have told me that ahead of time, and I could have grown it." This is all true. Yes. <laughs> but it, but it's not true. They told you you have to grow it because we have the action figure. Oh no no, they didn't say you have to grow it because. They had the action figure, but they did have a beard on the action figure, and that's why I had a beard in the movie. Uh, they had the action figure, you know, made. I, I mean, obviously, you know, the design of Star Wars is so comprehensive and so detailed and so extraordinary, and they they must have taken the decision that this particular character would have a beard, so I had to have a beard in the film. Thank you. That's one. Next question. This one over there. Well, come on. Up. Sort of to follow up on that one, the, the head tails and the costume, I was just kind of wondering what was the process of going from human female to <laughs> just complete Twilight dancer, like what was the kind of day to day, how long did you spend in makeup, and then to both of you, just what was a, a general day of filming like? For myself, I had to get out of my bed at 3.30 in the morning and get into the studio by 4 and stand there semi-nude and get layers of green paint, but body paint just piled onto me, because I'm so dark, they had to put about three or four layers on. And this took about four hours, which was a long time. Um, but just to see the transformation, and then putting the leather and lace onto me, and, and just suddenly seeing Ula being born, which is wonderful. But the disadvantage about having all that makeup on, I couldn't go anywhere, so like in my, I had to stay in my dressing room, and it was it was quite challenging. But once I got on set, it was it was worth the pain, especially getting up at three thirty in the morning. Three thirty in the morning, Sammy is. Uh, listen, that would be a sleep in for me. I had to get up at two o'clock in the morning and go to the studio, and every single hair of that beard was individually placed in my chin, and I didn't get up to seven. <laughs> No, uh, I, I'm sure you realize I, I didn't have uh, anything remotely like that, uh, and great dedication from Femi, but it, it, filming is is long, 
and yeah. it's it's extremely tiring and you're normally sort of at the studio by six o'clock or six thirty and you may not finish until seven or eight or nine and, and you know this is when you had your conversations with mark you used to just come up and sit next to me and just have a chat with me um billy did the same but then if it was long hours i'd be back in my dressing room and i'd take a book with me but back in those days um we didn't have computer we didn't have all that kind of P PSPs and stuff like that. So um, that's what I did. It was when I went back in 1996. I, again, I just stayed in my dressing room, so I knew I had to take a book. How about you? I, I absolutely would agree with that. Uh, you know, if there was a short period, the actors would be chatting, telling stories, or whatever. You know, hearing the latest gossip. If it was a long period, and sometimes it was, the, you know, the, when when they shoot in a certain direction and then they turn around. And, and do it in the opposite. Yeah. It takes forever to turn around. Um, and so one would go to one's dressing room, and as Femi says, of course, I've forgotten. You know, whenever I get on a bus now or a public transport, not that everybody's looking at their mobile phone and they're all doing that. And that didn't exist when we filmed. So you either read a book or did a crossword, and that was it. You know? Okay, thank you very much for Thank you. And time for a few more questions, right this way. Hello, I saw you. <laughs> I figured you did. I was like, I had to go like this. Oh, yeah, to make sure that yeah, that was me. I was just wondering if, when you guys were filming, if you knew then if anyone had any kind of like inklings at all that it was going to be as big as it is now. No idea. I mean, it was Star Wars and Empire was out, so it was pretty big. We just didn't know it was going to reach those heights. I mean, for me, as I said earlier on, it, it was part of my career, a, a wonderful job, um, and I stepped in and I stepped out of and I just continued on. I didn't think I was going to get a phone call 16 years later to come back and reprise the role. Um, so it's been a, it, it's just been wonderful little diamonds, I think, that's just come into our lives. I, I really didn't realise what I'd got myself involved with at all. I, I did the job, it was exciting, it was fun to do, and that was the end of it. And then, about four or five months later, a friend of mine called me in London and said, there's a doll of you in Hamleys, which is a huge toy. And I said, what? Uh, a doll? And the word action figure had gotten into our consciousness at that stage. And I said, you're joking. And they said, no, no, absolutely. So um, I rushed into Hamleys. Uh, no, I, did, I wish I had. And, uh, and sure enough, there it was. And that's when the penny dropped. And I thought, uh oh, uh, this might be around for quite some time. And as it turned out, um, that particular year, which must have been 83 years, where it was released, those action figures were the highest selling toys in the UK that okay. Christmas. Every kid because they were very cleverly priced. They were at like 99 pence, which is like 99 cents, say, or that. And so every kid could, out of their pocket money, would be able to collect one every week, and that's what a lot of people did. And the very, very wise and very clever children uh, didn't open them. <laughs> Sadly, I was not one of those children. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Right this way. And if you have one more question after this, just let me know. You do? Okay, great, excellent. Uh, you've mentioned um, being called back for the for the, uh, the, the 1990 special edition yeah. of 1997, yeah. uh, which was, you know, for the Star Wars fans, it's a pretty unique situation you were in because you came back and they didn't have to do, it was still yeah. looked just the same as you had. <laughs> Would you talk uh, a little bit about that process and coming back and what you what, what you did and, and uh, what you, the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was bizarre because I, I back then, I think it was 1995, I, was, I just wanted to escape from London. I didn't tell anybody where I was. And I went over to New York and I stayed with a really good friend of mine with her for five days. And I was out shopping and I got back and she said, there's a phone call um, that's a message for you from Lucas Film. And I went, oh, absolutely rubbish, they don't even know, my parents don't know where I am. And they said, no, no, it's a phone call, this casting director. 
has called up and she wants to call back. So I called, called this number and she said it's Robin Gerland and she was casting for special edition. She said, look, um, George Lucas is really interested in revamping your scene, your scene. Um, um, we, we want you, um, we would like you to come back and do it, but we don't know if you've changed, so you need to take some photos of yourself. So I went back, went to this tacky gym in, in, in New York somewhere, took some tacky photos and sent them to them at Fed Express. And she said, oh, no, 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 you haven't changed, you haven't changed. Um, we'd like to fly you out to San Francisco um, to come and do some more footage. Because you'll have to fit in your original costume, that's right. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> like, and honestly, you know, when I was on set, I saw those donuts and I went, oh. But anyway, that's how I was. And if I hadn't, because all the people at ILM, they said, oh, no, you'll never find her. And the casting director said, we have a sort of, I have a sixth sense, I think I will. They said, no, just CGI her, just CGI her in. And she said, no, I found her. So that's how it happened. So I, I went back. Uh, and and did some more some more filming, which is wonderful and bizarre, and deja vu. <laughs> and last question. All right, I got I got kind of a two parter, and then I'm going to end in light. Uh, Dermot, how often do you break out the action figure and play it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second, uh, I mean, would would you ever consider maybe dancing and giving Billy D some some pointers for? where he was on Dancing with the Stars. Oh, I didn't know. Was he on Dancing with the Stars? How did he do? Yeah, not real, real good. He, he, he ended up having to bow out because of, uh, I think, back problems or whatnot. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I had no idea because we don't get Dancing with the Stars. We, but, um, you know, we get strictly not come dancing. But no, I would have, no, I would have emailed his, his son and, and did via and give him some tips. I didn't know that. <laughs> I have to confess, I, I've stopped playing with myself. <laughs> Very nicely done, ladies and gentlemen. There was Charlie Kevin Tanner. They'll be at their table signing and photos. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.